tomorrow. Members were back in their home districts last week, and representatives will gavel in at 2 p.m. tomorrow to debate a number of bills under suspension of the rules, uh, including one renewing certain Patriot Act provisions. You can see live coverage of the House tomorrow on C-SPAN and the Senate here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. Chaplain Dr. Barry Black will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, the center of our joy, thank you for the privilege of prayer. In a world filled with change and decay, Lord, we're grateful that we can always call to you the changeless one. Today, we ask you to guide our lawmakers. Shine the light of your wisdom and truth upon their path. Give them patience to wait for your clear guidance and courage to follow where you lead. Remove pride from their hearts and replace it with a spirit of humility and unity. We pray in your great name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., February 7, 2011, to the Senate. Under provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Christopher A. Coons, a senator from the state of Delaware, to perform the duties of the chair. Son Daniel K. Noe, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. The Majority Leader. I see unanimous consent that the order of the vote scheduled at 5.30 be as follows. The remainder of the consent remain in effect. Calendar number six would be first. Calendar number three would be second. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, following leader remarks will be pre morning business until 3 p.m. At 3 p.m., the Senate will resume consideration of the Federal Aviation Administration bill. There will be a short recess around 4.20 p.m. in order to welcome the Prime Minister of Slovenia to the Senate floor. At 4.30, the Senate will turn to executive session to debate concurrently three district court nominations. Those nominations are Paul Holmes of Arkansas, Diana Saldana of Texas, and Marco Hernandez of Oregon. At 5.30, there will be two roll call votes on confirmation of the Saldana and Holmes nomination in the order that I uh, was, that just was approved by the chair. Mr. President, Ronald Reagan's second inauguration was the first one I attended as a member of Congress. It was bitterly cold that day. While the temperature sank into the single digits, Reagan became the first and only president to take the oath of office in the Capitol Rotunda. He said in that indoor inaugural address, and I quote, history is a ribbon, always unfurling. History is a journey. And if we continue our journey, we think of those that traveled before us, end of quote. Yesterday would have been President Reagan's 100th birthday. Today we think of President Reagan and how he steered America's travels through history's journey. I first met President, Re President Reagan when he's governor of California. I was the lieutenant governor of Nevada, and we met at he in Heavenly Valley on the Nevada side of Lake Tahoe to watch the first annual hot dogging skiing championship. And we, as, as I said, I first met him and we had a wonderful visit. I enjoyed that day very, very much. His own travels took him um, not only Lake Tahoe in my state, but through the entire state. California's Ronald Reagan was a close friend of Nevada's. In his earliest days as an actor, he entertained crowds at the last frontier on the Las Vegas Strip. Decades later, the same week Ronald Reagan became governor of California, 
Paul Axel became governor next door in Nevada. When Reagan first sought the presidency, Laxalt managed his campaign. And when President Reagan worked down the street at the White House, Paul Laxalt worked here as Nevada's senior senator. It was a special relationship, a unique relationship, one so close that some called Senator Laxalt the first friend. And he was that. I was fortunate enough to see firsthand President Reagan's appreciation for Nevada. After talking to Nevadans in Ely and across eastern Nevada, I came to the conclusion that I should drop some wilderness that I was going to put in place and instead form a national park. Nevada didn't have a national park, and we would call it the Great Basin National Park. After I introduced that legislation and it passed, President Reagan's Secretary of Agriculture recommended that he veto, which would be Nevada's only national park. The Agriculture Secretary didn't much like the idea of a young member of Congress and the other political party putting such a bill on the President's desk. Mr. President, I was worried about that. Word came to me that the President was going to veto this bill that was important to me. And I asked for a meeting with his superintendent of parks, National Parks Director. He had been the superintendent of parks for Ronald Reagan when Reagan was governor of California. His name was William Penn Mott. Uh, when he came to see me, he had been in uh, service of our country in many different ways. He was an elderly man when he came to see me. And I explained to him what was happening. And that, some, that I was told that President Reagan, upon recommendation of one of his cabinet members, was going to veto my bill. And that man looked at me and he said, President Reagan's not going to veto that bill. He said, when I was a young park ranger in 1928, Key Pittman, who was a famous Nevada senator, very close to President um, Roosevelt, sent me to Nevada to find a place for a national park. He said, that's my park. I'm the one that said it would go there. That's where it should go. And it never made it legislatively. But because of that meeting I had and Ronald Reagan's uh, understanding of what politics was all about, he didn't veto my bill. He overruled his secretary, and together, Harry Reid and Ronald Reagan created the Great Basin National Park. It wasn't the last time President Reagan and I worked together to preserve our West. Mr. President, I introduced legislation that was really important legislation. It, is, uh, it involved two Indian tribes, two endangered species. It involved Lake Tahoe. It involved two rivers, the Truckee and Carson Rivers. I think I mentioned two Indian tribes, a huge wetlands that had gone from a couple of hundred thousand acres to maybe less than a thousand very putrid acres. Birds died eating, eating, drinking there. It was, it, it was uh, their wetlands had basically dried out. It was a very important piece of legislation. But I got it passed. I got it passed here, and I went to the House and got it passed. And again, President Reagan's advisors recommended that he veto that bill. Part of it was because of who pushed the legislation through. But President Reagan knew how important it was to Lake Tahoe, and one of his very close, one of his advisors, I'm sorry, one of his uh, assistants, that's the word I was trying to find, Sig Rogich went and talked to him. Sig's a longtime Nevadan, worked very closely with President Reagan and with President Bush, and talked to him about this important legislation. And it wasn't vetoed. He signed this bill, in spite of people recommending that this be uh, not signed. President Reagan's help in ending this water war meant a lot to me because he knew that when Americans are all in this together, even local issues, even statewide issues, are of all our concern. I remember how he signed my bill to establish this park because the view of the national park embodied his vision of the nation. He never looked at the legislation 
has a map of red states and blue states and purple states, but has a landscape of states colored by green forests and brown deserts and clear waters. My legislation, entitled the Negotiated Settlement, has changed that part of the country, Mr. President. Lake Tahoe is better off. The Indian tribes are better off. We've preserved a lake, Lake Pyramid. We have, it was really um, landmark legislation. And it could have been done without his signature. He knew that when the sun breached the horizon each day, the morning that dawned in America was a morning for all Americans, for families of all backgrounds. And he said in that second inaugural address, quote, we've worked and acted together, not as members of political parties, but as Americans, end of quote. Ronald Reagan was a Republican president from the West who cherished a famously close friendship with Tip O'Neill, a Democratic Speaker of the House from the East. Ronald Reagan was a patriot who created a friendship with Mikhail Gorbachev, the leader of a nation he called an evil empire. He would make certain America could defend herself, but quietly sent a diplomatic team to start negotiating with the Soviet Union the minute he took office. Ronald Reagan knew politics has always been and always will be about compromise. And that compromise can only happen when politicians share personal relationships. He knew public servants work better as partners rather than, pa than partners rather than partisans. And as much as he criticized government, he knew it wasn't a faceless machine. He appreciated that government exists. As Lincoln said, of, for, and by the people. That's why he was more beholden to simple pragmatism than stubborn principle. That's why he, a staunch conservative, raised taxes 11 times when the economy needed revenue. It's why he viewed the challenge of immigration through a practical lens. It's why he knew America could be strong and would be stronger still in a world without nuclear weapons. He wasn't perfect, and I didn't agree with many of his politics or policies. But I always admired the way he captured our country's imagination. I always respected his honest assessment of his strengths and limitations alike. He was um, somebody who could look at himself and we would all smile a little bit. Mr. President, one time he was, uh, he, he was running for governor of California and someone asked him, do you think you'll be a good governor? He said, I don't know, I've never acted the part. Um, that's who he was. He honestly assessed who he was, his strengths and limitations, and I really admired the way he humbly surrounded himself with good, smart people. A century after his birth, Ronald Reagan's legacy remains as enduring as anyone who's ever unfurled the long ribbon of our nation's history. That legacy lives not merely in his policies, and to honor it is not enough to try to apply his solutions of 30 years ago to the problems we confront today. Rather, we should remember how he respected his colleagues and his constituents. We should try to emulate the confidence he communicated. Ronald Reagan was a proud neighbor of Nevada who, who united and motivated us by reminding us that all Americans live in the same neighborhood. That's a lesson I still remember today, and that's a lesson I remember best about our 40th president, Ronald Reagan. Would the chair announce the business for the day? Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. And under the previous order, the Senate will be in a period of morning business until 3 p.m., with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each. No tabs of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Falcon.
President. The Republican leader. I ask that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection, so ordered. <clears throat> Mr. President, earlier today, uh, the President spoke to the Chamber of Commerce in what some have described as an effort to make nice with the business community. I'll leave others to analyze what that speech means politically. The first concern of every, of every American is what will it mean for the economy? As I've said before, what the President says matters a lot less than what he does. So we'll just have to wait and see whether the President's actions uh, support his rhetoric. And it's in that spirit that I'd like to suggest one thing the President could do immediately with Republican support to show he's serious about jobs and the economy. He could work with us to pass free trade agreements with Colombia and Panama that have been languishing for years. We welcome the President's support for the South Korea Free Trade Agreement, which has earned strong bipartisan support. But by failing to show the same commitment in passing these two other free trade agreements, the President is missing out on an important opportunity to do something good for the economy and for jobs. The President says he wants to double U.S. exports in five years. Free trade agreements with Colombia and Panama would go a long way toward meeting that goal and creating jobs right here in America by opening markets in Latin America. In my view, the time for delay on these two agreements is over. The President needs to do more than promise to pursue these agreements as he did today. He should work with Congress to pass these two agreements and sign them into law. This should be an easy one. Colombia is a strong strategic ally in South America. It's made great strides in addressing the concerns of labor union critics here in the U.S. It's come a long way. <clears throat> we should not walk away from Colombia now. As for Panama, our two nations have had a strong strategic and economic uh, ties literally for years. This agreement would only strengthen those bonds and build on them. As America sits on the sidelines, our competitors around the world, including the EU and Canada, are moving forward to lower barriers to trade and increase access for their businesses and workers. This is unacceptable, particularly for an administration that is claiming as its top priority that it wants to win the future. It won't be enough for Republicans and it shouldn't be enough for the business community to allow the administration's trade agenda to start and end with South Korea. We should be passing all pending trade agreements and inking new ones on a bipartisan basis, even when it requires the President bringing his own party along. We've heard Secretary Clinton, Senator Baucus, and Ambassador Kirk all express support for submitting the Columbia FTA to Congress. But the President's own pronouncements continue to fall short. It's not enough for the President to say good things about free trade while siding with labor bosses over job creators and the vast majority of American workers who do not belong to unions and who would largely benefit from opening markets overseas. We shouldn't allow labor union bosses to have veto power over economic policies that benefit all of us. So the question is, will the President allow our allies in South America to continue waiting for us to move forward, or will he send the message that America stands by her allies and is prepared to do something good for American workers, good for the American economy, and good for key allies. Congress is ready to pass these two deals today. It's time for the President to commit to do the same. Mr. President, <clears throat> I yield the floor. The Senator from Nebraska. Mr. President, uh, I uh, compliment the Minority Leader on his comments on trade. I wish to speak uh, in morning business uh, on the same topic, and I won't have to speak long because I've talked about this many times since I joined the Senate just over uh, two years ago. Today I want to focus, Mr. President, on the us Colombia trade agreement. This agreement was signed by both the United States and Colombia on November 22nd of 2006. It's been around many, many years. It is expected to create several thousand jobs, yet for 
five years now to the detriment of U.S. exporters and job seekers, policymakers have punted on this important trade agreement. The Obama administration has been sitting on the sidelines watching other countries slowly chip away at U.S. competitiveness in the Colombian marketplace. Our friends to, to the north in Canada and to the south in Mexico wisely negotiated new agreements with Colombia. They saw the void that U.S. companies and workers should have been filling, and they acted to fill that void themselves. You see, Mr. President, I believe it is time that we stop watching other countries make the moves that have been teed up for this country for now about five years. Implementing the agreement would increase U.S. exports by more than a half a billion dollars annually and create almost 4,000 much needed jobs in the United States. Simply stated, passing this agreement would help to improve our economy. In last year's State of the Union address, we heard our president say, and I'm quoting, if America sits on the sidelines while other nations sign trade deals, we will lose the chance to create jobs on our shores. And I applauded his comments. I applauded his desire to increase exports. But unfortunately, no action was taken on the President's words. During this last year's State of the Union address, the President again acknowledged the need for the Columbia Trade Agreement by saying, and again I'm quoting Mr. President, we will strengthen our trade relations with key partners like South Korea and Panama and Colombia, unquote. But once again, these words will ring hollow with no action. Yet again today, in a much-touted speech to the Chamber of Commerce, the President talked about pursuing the Columbia Trade Agreement. And I must admit, I asked the question, what on earth is left to pursue? The agreement was signed nearly five years ago. It's ready for approval. All the President needs to do is submit it for our action. And if the President thinks there was more pursuing to do, well then, what have we been waiting for the past couple of years? Why hasn't the administration pursued whatever it is they think needs pursuing for now over two years? <clears throat> Americans who are out of work know that this administration is missing an opportunity to say to thousands of Americans, you have a job. Our job creators are waiting. My hope is that the President stands behind his remarks today. This is a golden opportunity for the President to send a signal that his words do have meaning and to show that we can, in fact, work together in a bipartisan way. He could submit the Columbia Trade Agreement to Congress for approval right today and send an enormously powerful message that when he says pursue, he means action, not stall. You see, Mr. President, folks from my state are anxiously awaiting approval of this agreement, as are folks from around the, the country. We should all be reminded that workers and businesses in our home states will benefit from the Columbia Trade Agreement. Our farmers and our ranchers would benefit from the elimination of tariffs on more than 77 percent of agricultural goods. American workers will see more of their products sold as 76 percent of Colombian tariffs on our industrial goods are eliminated, wiped out immediately. No doubt about it, this agreement will have a real impact on Nebraskans and other Americans who work hard every day to make a better life for their families. 
Mr. President, let me share today just a couple of examples of Nebraskans who want to see the U.S.-Columbia Trade Agreement ratified. Take Nebraska-based manufacturer Valmont Industries, for example. Valmont has loyal customers in Columbia who buy its irrigation pivots. Currently, Columbia imposes a 15% duty or tax on those pivot systems, which would be eliminated by the Columbia Trade Agreement. You see, if the 15% duty is in fact eliminated, Velmont estimates they would gain market share against European competitors and add 10 to 15 new jobs in Nebraska alone. Or take Rick Larson of Potter, Nebraska. He grows wheat and corn. He has a small livestock operation. Unfortunately, the market share of our American farmers is declining rapidly in Colombia. When we signed the agreement, American farmers like Rick Larson in Potter supplied 76% of the wheat to Colombia. Today, they sell 22%. You see, for Rick, that means he's lost 15 cents per bushel of wheat. That impacts a real family. It's a similar story with corn. He's lost four cents per bushel. Well, in a place where we throw around the idea of trillions, that may not sound like very much, but it means Rick's wheat and corn revenues were down $7,600 last year just because the administration had not submitted those trade agreements for our approval. Farmers like Rick cannot believe we are sitting on our hands while our market share is evaporating right before our eyes. He shudders to think what will happen to his sales prices once Canada beats us to a free trade agreement, even though it was signed two years after ours. Mr. President, I can tell you it is not easy to regain lost market share once it is gone. And it worries our exporters when they see their government standing between them in a promising marketplace. Nebraska farmers and ranchers and those across the country, well, I'll just tell you, they can compete with anyone. They can compete with anyone, and all they're asking for is a level playing field and a fair shot. We have been giving exporters from Colombia more than a fair shot through the Andean Trade Preferences Act, which is set to expire on February 12th. Under the agreement, get this, a whopping 90% of goods and services coming into our country to compete with our citizens enter absolutely duty-free. I think we should extend the Andean trade preferences but we should also knock down the barriers for our own exporters and level the playing field. We must give our workers that level playing field by approving the Columbia Free Trade Agreement. Mr. President, American exporters have waited too long to realize the benefits of this trade agreement. Isn't it time? to get serious about beating our global competitors in the Colombian market? Don't we all realize that U.S. jobs depend upon this? You see, Mr. President, we all represent people like Valmont and farmers like Rick. Let's pay tribute to their entrepreneurial spirit by tearing down Columbia trade barriers that inhibit 
economic growth in this great nation. I urge the President to transmit the signed U.S.-Columbia trade agreement to Congress immediately. This is one senator that's going to stand behind the President and do everything I can to try to get that agreement ratified here in the Senate. It is time for Speaker Boehner and Leader Reid to call it up for consideration as soon as it reaches their desk. But most importantly, it's time for the President to lay it on their desks. Mr. President, I yield the floor and I suggest the absence of a quorum. Thank you. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka. Senators are in a quorum call at this time. They expected today, uh, they started today what they expect to be a short work week. Democrats will be attending a retreat in Charlottesville, Virginia later in the week. And at about 3 o'clock Eastern, we expect them to resume debate on a bill reauthorizing the Federal Aviation Administration. And around 4.30 p.m. Eastern, debate and votes on some judicial nominations. There are three nominees. The two that will be voted on are a Western District Judgeship in Arkansas and a Southern Texas District. And the third nominee is for one in Oregon. That will be agreed to by unanimous consent. On the other side of the Capitol today, the House is not in session, and members there will return tomorrow at 2 p.m. to debate a number of bills, including one to renew the provisions of the Patriot Act. 
Coming up tonight on our companion network C-SPAN, we will take you live across town from Capitol Hill to George Washington University for a conversation with former White House press secretaries. They'll be talking about making and shaping the news. Again, that's live tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. Some of those former White House press secretaries who will be expected to attend include Ari Fleischer, D.D. Myers, and Dana Perino. And usually found on the other side of the podium from those press secretaries, Ed Henry, CNN's senior White House correspondent, will also join in the discussion tonight at George Washington University. You're watching live coverage of the Senate here on C-SPAN 2.
Well, the Senate's in a quorum call waiting for senators to come to the floor. A quick update on an earlier speech by President Obama, who spoke to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce earlier today. He announced that he's putting together a new group of business leaders aimed at letting the government know what they need in order to spur growth. And that group is scheduled to meet later this month. According to the New York Times, the president urged American businesses to get in the game by making trillions of dollars available that are currently being held in reserves. And he said the action would create a virtuous cycle with more sales, higher demand, and greater profits, putting some people back to work. The president also pledged to eliminate unneeded regulations, simplify the tax code, but he said companies have a responsibility to help the economy recover. And Mr. Obama speaking at the U.S. Chamber, which has opposed most of his health care and banking plans. Piece of legislation. I come to the floor pretty often to talk about the deficit, and today I want to talk about something very specific that we can do to address this matter. The Orphan Earmark Act would rescind earmarks that remain 90 percent or more unused nine years after being appropriated. In early January, USA Today published an article examining 20 years of earmarks that have not been spent. According to the analysis, in at least 3,649 of those earmarks, not a single dollar had gone toward its intended purpose. And many of our orphan earmarks also count against state's share of federal highway funds that have taken billions of dollars away from the state transportation departments across this nation. During the past 20 years, orphan earmarks reduced the amount of money that states could have received in federal highway funding by almost $7.5 billion. That's $7.5 billion that states could have used to replace obsolete bridges, repair aging roads, and bring jobs to rural areas. As all of us know, when lawmakers earmark money, even if it's never spent for pet highway projects, that money still reduces what states receive from federal government. In my own state of Alaska, $187 million in funding was lost out in the past 20 years because of orphan earmarks. Now, I know some of you are concerned at, about states losing out on money that we all could use, especially nowadays, but let's not worry. I don't want to take away your earmarks that help communities in need at great jobs. We are talking about earmarks that have been abandoned for more than 10 years and are just sitting like uncashed checks. Dr. Coburn and I have addressed this in our legislation. We have built in a 12-month period, and I repeat, a 12-month period for agency heads to make sure that earmarks can be used before rescinding. On that note, I want to make clear something else. I do not personally support an earmark moratorium. I know my friend from Oklahoma and I disagree on this earmark funding, but I believe it's vital to my home state of Alaska. We have unique needs and have relied on this critical funding from day one to support health, safety, and jobs. What I have a problem with is wasteful spending that could have otherwise been used for a project or cut the deficit. Our legislation requires the director of OMB to submit to Congress and publicly post on the OMB website an annual report that includes a listing and accounting for earmarks with unobligated balances summarized by agencies, including the amount of the original earmark, amount of the unobligated balances, and the year when the funding expires the number of rescissions resulting from the section and the annual savings resulting from the section for the previous fiscal year. And finally, a listing and accounting for earmarks provided for federal agencies scheduled to be rescinded at the end of the current fiscal year. Senator Feingold offered an amendment last March to the FAA bill to rescind any DOT earmarks that remained 90 percent or more unobligated for nine years after being appropriated with the possibility of holding funds one more year for earmarks the agency head believed would be funded within, the 12, within 12 months. Because Senator Feingold had modified the legislation to reflect concerns by Senator Boxer and Murray, the Senate voted 87 to 11 to pass this amendment. 
However, as we all know, the FAA bill did not pass last year. The Coburn baggage bill is modeled after a Bush administration proposal from 2008 and would have rescinded any highway and bridge earmark funds from the 1998 highway T TLU 21 that had less than 10 percent of the funds spent or obligated. That proposal only would have saved about $626 million, including $389 million in 152 earmarks that had no funding obligated a decade after passing. The Coburn baggage bill targets all orphan earmarks, not just those in the highway bill. Mr. President, let me just conclude, and I know my friend from Oklahoma is here to also speak to it. I will tell you, when I became mayor in 2003 in Anchorage, Alaska, we looked at all our bonds that voters had voted on year in and year out, and we looked at all the projects. And what we found was a sizable amount were being spent on the projects that they were intended. But there was another percentage that for years had just been laying there for a variety of reasons. Some the project didn't fan out, uh, they maybe didn't get enough money from another source, or the project just vanished from the books because of public uh, opposition to it. But what we found was we were passing bonds for projects that may not have ever or gone forward. So we cleaned the books up when I was mayor to make sure that occurred. And then we did one other thing, which I think this legislation now on a federal level really focuses on, not only make sure we clean up the books, but also when we have money, making it very clear you need to spend it for the project that was identified for. When we brought bonds forward in April of every year, we made sure that those projects that were on that bond that voters voted for, that they put their taxpayer money toward, that 75 percent or more of those projects would be completed or substantially underway by the end of the year. That was important to make sure taxpayers knew their dollars were being used, not just hoarded or put away in a, an account somewhere and not having a project that they thought was happening. So I think this is a, a good piece of legislation. It brings fiscal responsibility to the money that's out there. And when you think about it, if you have a piece of legislation, an earmark, that's been not utilized, 90 percent of it not utilized for 10 years or more, there is no reason that you should have that money in some bank account, in some uh, agency somewhere hidden away. It should be come back and go toward the deficit. So, Mr. President, I yield the floor at this time to my colleague from Oklahoma, but I'm honored to be able to join him in this effort to bring some, and I'll use my words, fiscal sanity to this effort of trying to figure out how to manage this federal government's budget in a better way. Mr. President. The Senator from Oklahoma. Well, first of all, let me uh, thank my colleague from Alaska. Uh, as somebody who's been working on areas of fiscal management in our federal government for the last six plus years, <clears throat> this is a one small step whether it saves $500 million or it saves a billion. The important thing is America knows we need to do this 1,500 more times. Uh, you hear a lot in the press now that with the, the Republican appropriators and the Republican budgeteers, the, the battle of how much to cut. It's the wrong language. The deficit is $1.5 trillion. This year it was 1.4 last year. We have tons of areas, like my colleague and my former colleague, the senator from Wisconsin, Russ Feingold, knows full well where we don't effectively utilize the money that's been given to us or that we're borrowing uh, against our kids' future. So this, this is a great start. We need to do this every day on every bill that comes before us. We can find it. We've identified 650 sets of duplications in the federal government. And they're not small duplications. There's 49 job training programs across nine different agencies. There's 105 science, technology, engineering, and math programs, something the president in the State of the Union said he wanted to enhance. We don't have a metric on any of them. We already have 105 programs. We're spending uh, $18 billion on job training. We don't know if it's working. And we don't know if the people we trained have gotten a job in the area that we trained them. So th I'm excited about my colleague joining with me, and my hope is that we can set a trend. 
that with every bill that comes out, we'll start looking. And by the way, we do have coming from the Government Accountability Office the first third of all the government programs. When we inquired two years ago into the Congressional Research Service and to the Office of Management and Budget and the GAO, we said, well, give us a list of all the programs. Do you realize nowhere in the federal government do we have a list of all the programs where we spend money? And we're highly critical of the Defense Department because it can't pass an audit, and we rightly should be, but we can't pass an audit because we don't even know what we're doing. So this, is, this, is, this should not be controversial at all. It would, and it should save us close to a billion dollars when it's all said and done. And that's a billion dollars we won't borrow from the Chinese. And all we've got to do that is 1,500 more times. And we, the, the fact is, is we can. We're like that little engine. We can. We can get up that hill. But what it's going to take is reaching across the aisle, like the senator from Alaska and I have, and say, here's an area of common ground. It's based in common sense, and it's something that should be done and should be done now so that we don't. Uh, you know, in, in this, the data, it, it's just, just to show you how silly this is, in Atlanta, there's still money for the 1996 Olympics. Fourteen years ago, there's $2.7 million set in a bank account. They can't spend on it because the Olympics has already occurred, but the, we've still got that money out there. That's the kind of silly stuff that happens when the federal government's reaching into areas that it shouldn't be reaching into. And, and what we can do is we can not to lay blame, not to say it's about earmarks or not earmarks. Here's a common sense solution that says here's a way to free up a billion dollars or 500 million. If it's 500 million, great. But here's a way to do that. I would also take time to spend on the floor now just to elucidate that the, the President's Fiscal Commission outlined $4 trillion over the next 10 years that we could eliminate that will go a long ways towards starting to solve some of our problems. So my hope is, is with this amendment, we'll start a trend where we can grab hold of and capture the things that make sense, that most Americans will never miss, and if they do miss it, it's because they're going to get something better instead and more efficient instead. And we start down this road. And this is a great start. I congratulate my colleague uh, for his in initiative in bringing this back up. And, and what we need to do is now we need to get on the phone, get our colleagues in the House to do the same thing, and make sure when this bill goes through and this amendment's adopted that it gets and it actually happens. Don't forget that the Bush administration want, wants this to happen. So does the Obama administration. Think about the amount of labor we're spending taking care of details on things that can't get spent or won't be spent, and the amount of man hours that goes into that. And, and I just thought I'd finish up with one of, the, one of the, the recommendations of the Fiscal Commission was on the federal workforce. <clears throat> and there's a wonderful article that was uh, published by... Uh, in Murray on February 3rd about how many federal employees do we have. And it's easy for us to think about the fact that we, when we count true, just true federal employees, it's 2.8 million. But that doesn't come close to the actual number of employees that the federal government has. When you add up uh, what is actually there, uh, and you add in postal employees, you add in military, you add in contractors, we're at 11 million federal employees. And there's a lot of areas, we have a great federal workforce, there's a lot of areas where we can be efficient and downside, we don't have to lay anybody off, we can, we can just not add. And what we can do is, through attrition, markedly decrease the number of federal employees we have, which will be that second, third, and fourth billion dollars. The other thing that the, the, um, the commission recommended, uh, which the Obama administration embraced, was a freeze on salaries. But most of us don't recognize we've got $3 billion owed right now to the IRS and back taxes by federal employees. That's already been adjudicated. 
So, I mean, there's all sorts of things that we can do. So we've got lots of ideas. My pledge is to work across the aisle with our colleagues to try to find one of these every day or one of these every other day. And if we do that together, we don't have to borrow 40 cents out of every dollar that we spend in this country. We can take it down to 20 or 15 or down to zero so that we can, in fact, ensure the future for our children. So, again, I would thank my colleague. I would yield back the floor. I recognize and yield to my colleague from Alaska. Senator from Oklahoma, I, I just wanted to add, I, I thank you for your joining on this. And, and I will tell you, when you look at the, you're right, this should be non-controversial. This should be easy. I mean, it's like if you received a check uh, and it sits there for 10 years, I can guarantee you, if you're in a private business, as I have been, uh, you've written that off already. It's gone. And in this situation, what we're saying is, uh, there's 500 million, and I think you're right. It's probably when it's all tallied up, probably closer to a billion dollars sitting out there, that we did this once before with a great support on a much more narrow focus. If we did this on a regular basis, the opportunity is unlimited. And I just want to thank you. I know I've sat here in the presiding chair many times and uh, listened to your presentations regarding the budget and areas. We may not always agree, but when we find those agreements, Here's an opportunity, and I think this is an easy one in a lot of ways. There's other ones, as you know and I know, with regards to surplus property that the federal government has that's been idle or under incredible disrepair, not being utilized. From my real estate experience, I've seen this, and there is an enormous amount of resource there that could be turned right back into the private sector for future development that could actually grow the economy. Neil, for a minute. Absolutely. Just to give you detail. The federal government has $90 billion worth of property it's not using right now. We're spending $9 billion a year taking care of it. And we have a budget gimmick that says an agency that needs a new building, because we're going to account for the cost of that building in the year in which they buy it and charge it all to the agency, what are we doing now? We're leasing buildings. Right. I guarantee you we can own them much cheaper than we can lease them. And what we should be doing is changing that and getting rid of the excess property, lowering our cost to maintain it, there, there's nine out of the 1,500 we've got to do right there. If we would just right. do that and then change the way we purchase buildings for the federal government, the federal government, so that the agency can own it right. instead of lease it because it costs. I, I will, if the Senator would yield I, back, I, I would want to say I agree. As someone who's been in the real estate business for almost 30 years, there's enormous opportunity. I mean, I know when I was mayor, we put more of the lands, and we're not talking parks and monuments, we're talking about just surplus old buildings and sites that are no longer in use to put them back into operation, because not only will it save the federal government money in the sense of getting that surplus property off the books, but what you end up doing is turning that into economic development property for those communities, because private sector will come in, revitalize them, or use them in another means. So again, there are many ideas out there, and thank you very much for the opportunity to sponsor this with you. And as I would say at the beginning, as you said during your comments, 500 million, I think, is the, the minimum. I think it's closer probably to a billion just on this one idea. I yield the floor, Mr. President.